Evelyn to Philip, female dated September 25th, 1944. Dearest hubby, as I told you at the close of yesterday's letter, Mom and I went to the Lindley to see Two Girls and a Sailor, and I enjoyed it immensely. This picture and the one I saw last weekend in town, Janie, were two of the most enjoyable I've seen in a long time. Two Girls and a Sailor sported a large cast, including Gloria DeHaven, Van Johnson, Harry James, etc., Jimmy Durante, Lena Horn, Jose Turby, Gracie Allen, and a score of others. On our way home, who should we meet but Tilly and her mother? Tilly is on the outs with Etta, and I don't blame her. I haven't time nor room to give details, but I am surprised at Etta. No one did more for her than Till. Jules is in North Africa as a storekeeper and is past 38. Till is terribly bitter, and I can't say that I blame her. She's not looking as well as I remember her. Mrs. Medaway looks like a million. After chatting a little, Mom and I headed home, had tea and cake, and hit the hay about 1 a.m. And I had one picnic getting up this morning. It is still very cold, and my good old suit is serving its purpose. My folks had a letter from the War Department today advising them of Eddie's sorry I had to carry over just the S condition. It said that we would not hear from him till he was well enough to write. It also advised that we would hear from the War Department at intervals concerning his condition. They gave us a new address, which I would send if I had it at hand. I'll send it along as soon as I get it from the folks. This was a very good month for us insofar as savings is concerned. With the accumulation in the penny bank, plus a week's salary, I purchased another $25 bond, which means that between us, we bought $100 worth of bonds this month, or a saving of $75 plus a $7 cash deposit. I've never been able to save that much in one month, but it is due mostly to the fact that there aren't many gifts to buy during the month of September. I intend to do a lot of spending during October on myself if possible. I shall, however, buy a $50 bond with my allotment so that we may reach the $1,000 figure. In fact, we'll pass it, because once I buy another $50 bond, plus the bond I'll receive from you for the month of September, we'll have exactly $1,025 in bonds. Tonight, Adele wore the peach sleepers Ethel brought her, and peach is definitely Adele's color. She was all rosy-cheeked after her bath, and her complexion looked like peaches and cream. When I got home from work, I called her on the phone and asked her several questions. I asked if she was a good girl all day and got the answer, yes. Did you wet your pants? No. Then she proceeded to tell me that a yady, lady fell down the teps and hurt her knee. She doesn't miss a trick, so help me. I had to do a large wash immediately after upon arriving from work. I failed to catch Adele last night and had some sheets, blankets, and two pairs of sleepers. In this weather, it takes the sleepers almost two days to dry, and so I was anxious to get them washed and on the line. I just finished putting Adele in bed and intend to follow her in just a little while. Gosh, but I wish you were following me up. I'm in the mood for love, but wasn't I always, just as I am always and always your Ev. Philip to Evelyn, 25 September 1944. Darling Ev, since returning to camp after my leave, I've been so busy that I've hardly had time to breathe. I returned about midnight of the 23rd 
and just haven't had a chance to write till now. I am CQ tonight, so don't be surprised if this turns out to be a real longie. Not only do I have a lot to tell you, but I have quite a number of your letters to answer. There really isn't much to relate about my stay in Colchester. I spent most of the first day with the Wolves and the second day with the Marxes. Bert treated me to lunch on the first day and I treated him on the second. I ate supper with the Wolves one day and with the Marx the next. Outside of that, I saw one movie, Broadway Rhythm, with George Murphy, Ginny Sims, Gloria DeHaven, and others. It was a Technicolor musical, and not half bad. The weather was very nice most of the time. I tried to wheedle Bert into accompanying me to the dog races at Ipswich, but Saturday is his busy day, and he couldn't leave. I didn't care to go alone, so I killed the rest of the day with the Marxes and their kids. Carol, who will be three in about two weeks, is a cute little tyke full of the devil. She climbs all over me. Helena, about seven, is a pretty little miss, already she knows it, who tries to attract your attention by speaking in an unnaturally loud voice. She is, however, most erudite for her tender years. Even you, sweet, would envy her enunciation. Stanley, about four and a half years old, is a husky little rowdy, also full of the devil. Between the three of them, I had very little peace, I can, page two, assure you. Mark, which is really his first name, his surname being Scheinberg, is a crackerjack tailor, and I like just to sit and watch him work. I'm playing with the idea of having him make up an outfit for me, civilian I mean. He makes short jackets for officers that are really something to write home about. I was thinking I would like such a jacket with trousers to match and a good looking material. The cost, I suspect, would be rather high, but it would be an outfit to be proud of, I'll bet. If I knew we were going back to the States after it's, quote, over over here, end quote, I wouldn't hesitate a minute, but the future is so uncertain that I'm reluctant to do anything about it. However, I shall keep it in mind, and if it's a practice, if it's practical, I'll order it. I had planned to write while in Colchester, but somehow the opportunity never presented itself. I did have a nice restful break from the routine of the orderly room, though. And that was my purpose in leaving in the first place. Reporting to work in the morning yesterday, I found myself swamped with things that had come up while I was away. There was also, by way of consolation, a flock of mail from you, honey, and a letter from Jack N. I'm still trying to get even with my work, but while I am making some headway in that direction, there is still plenty to be done. Today, beside your email of the 17th September, I received a letter and two midget bulletins from Dot, and a rejection slip and a certificate signed by Sergeant Marion Hargrove from Yank. The latter was to inform me that they couldn't use my Etusa interlude and to keep trying. I'm page three, neither disappointed nor discouraged with the failure of my first effort to click. I rather thought it wouldn't because you have to be an Etusian to even get the point, let alone understand it. Besides, Fanny Hurst collected a couple of hundred rejection slips before she succeeded in having her first story published, so who am I to be discouraged? When I wrote it, I had no idea about trying to get it published, but some of the fellows seemed to think Yank should have a crack at it, so I bowed to their opinion. 
Anyway, there's no harm in trying, is there? I won't try to pretend, darling, that I wouldn't have liked it much better if they had accepted it. I would have, if only to make you a little proud of me. Someday I will, honey. You'll see. That just about covers all the news about me. And now to you and your letters. Just a minute while I sort them out. Here we are. Before me, I have your letters of 7 and 11 September and your V-mails of 14, 15, 16, 17 September. There is also Mom's letter, but the reply to that will have to wait, and she better not complain. Your letter of the 8th contained the snaps of you and the cheesecake and Jack. Just a few comments. You do look thin, sweet, and not nearly as healthy as I like to see you. What's the matter, honey? Are you working too hard? Not getting enough sleep, or what? Whatever the cause, I wish you'd correct it. The pumpkin looks positively adorable, especially in the one of her in the doorway. Seems to me that's about the prettiest little face I have ever seen. But why are you so careless about her panties, honey? She's a big girl now, and for age four, some reason or other, I don't like it when her panties are too much in evidence. Maybe you think I'm being ridiculously fussy, but there it is. And what are you going to do about it? How did you get her to put her head through the stair railings? Or was it spontaneous? Jack looks pounds heavier and very fit. One more thing, dear. Where in hell did you find that hairstyle? You know how I dislike curls, but you could hardly call those ringlets I see in the pictures curls. And ringlets I simply detest. As we say in military correspondence, please note and correct. Before I leave the subject of snapshots, Dottie, in her letter received today, enclosed a snap of herself with snuff and howl. She too looks thinner than I remember her. It can't be the rationing, because snuff looks much heavier. Howl is a handsome boy, no doubt about it. I like the post snuff is literally supporting his family. Dot on his knee and Hal on his shoulder. Wasn't Jack Ann at Camp Claiborne for his basic training? I still think Snuff will wind up in ordinance. I'm still waiting to hear from him, incidentally. My love to Dot, in case I don't get to write to her tonight. And now to your letters. Your mention of the Miss nice letters you received from Milt and Sid makes me feel doubly guilty that I haven't written to them. I haven't forgotten it, though, and someday, when I get the chance, I'll certainly avail myself of it. The trouble is, I get so little time for my correspondence, and that's not just an alibi, it's a fact. Are you sure I didn't mention that I'd written to Mike? I was under... Page 5, The Impression I Had. If I'm not mistaken, I also owe him a letter. Or do I? I'd better start making notes because I have difficulty remembering whom I owe letters. Thanks for the financial statement, sweet. I'm as happy as you are about your newfound sense of security. About hitting that goal you set in cash, I don't know. I'm afraid I'm a little hazy on your current holdings in that department. Don't, too much put, don't put too much stock in what the papers say about demobilization, Chippy. It is really impossible to con conjecture intelligently on the subject. There are so many ifs, ands, and buts. Just hope for the best and keep punching. And stop misspelling optimistic. Too bad Goldie held out that snap of her and Diana. I sure would like to get a peek at my one and only niece. 
Didn't you say a while back that you took some snaps of the pumpkin with her table and chair set? If not, why not? In closing, you reiterate your desire to get back once more to a normal married life and that you wished I were there draped across the sofa. I can understand that first part and fully share your sentiments, baby, but that second part stops me. Do I understand that you've had a change of heart about my napping on the sofa, or is it just a come on? You know, sweet, looking back, I wonder why I ever wasted our time laying on the sofa. I mean, I can't for the life of me understand how I could have been content just to lay alone on the sofa and sleep. I know, know now how much, page six, better I could have utilized that time. What a fool I was. But I've learned my lesson, Chippy. And when I next get the opportunity, you may be very sure that I won't fritter my time away napping on the sofa. Hell no. I'll merely take you gently by the arm and lead you upstairs to our bed and our room and to hell with what people will think. By the way, Chippy, is that why you used to get sore when I slept on the sofa? Did you have any ideas at the time? If you had and never told me, I'll never forgive you, so you better not confess to it. Uh-oh, that tore it. I can write rationally enough, baby, until I start remembering how sweet you were in my arms. And then I can think of nothing else. Darling Evie, I want you so. You know the feeling you describe as melting away? Well, that's me all over right now. So knowing you can appreciate why it is useless for me to write any further tonight, I can only kiss you fondly and longingly, whisper I adore you, baby, in your responsive ear, and reluctantly take my leave. Good night, my dearest one. My love and kisses for the pumpkin. Bless her, and my love to all. Devotedly, your Phil.